This is another report on living in the time of the coronavirus epidemic. I worry about basing the Trumpet's defense on free speech. Not because I wonder if that will be effective, but because I don't like to see trusty old freedom of speech taken out of its chest, measured, and asked where, precisely, does it begin and end. I prefer, if possible, to leave free speech alone, snoozing. The Trumpet's defense is being presented and the trial is still being televised. Though he is not testifying, it's clear that the Trumpet is telling his people what he wants them to say, at least in general terms. The lawyer he thought was too defensive, he's gone. The PM, by his own account, continues to be too busy to follow the trial. His complete attention is on COVID-19. Yet he comments on the trial every day, offhandedly. Today he said that he thought the Republican senators should examine their consciences and act responsibly. When this ends, and I think it will soon, I get the feeling that it won't end. The trial itself will cease, but the outcome won't satisfy anyone. And all the hard feelings that everyone had at the outset will only be intensified. My feeling is that the PM will say he stands for unity and that the trumpet, a deeply divisive and disturbed man, deserves his fate as an outcast. Though it's getting harder to do, in public at least, some Republicans are standing with the trumpet. Others including former staffers and associates and currently elected Republicans, like the turtle, are either backing away from him or separating themselves completely, calling him a bad man, a dangerous man. The defense ran a video of the trumpet repeatedly calling for law and order along with a succession of dummy craps calling for protest, saying that social justice sometimes cries out for breaking the laws and obeying a higher law, even if it's upsetting the existing order. It showed Fancy Bulldozy saying, I'm surprised there aren't more uprisings all over. The point man for the, de the defense said, let me be clear, we are here in this room because of hatred, not evidence. On a Saturday afternoon, the Senate voted 57 to 43, guilty and not guilty. Since 67 votes were required for conviction, the trumpet was acquitted again. I listened to some of the media experts commenting on this. To hear them, you would think he had been found guilty. Fifty, all fifty, dummy craps voted to convict, and seven Republicans. The experts focused on those seven Republican votes, calling them historic and unprecedented. There was the feeling, in me at least, that these members of the media felt that if all the Republicans had listened to the evidence and not decided like low-grade hacks to cleave to the party line, if instead they had done their job, they would have convicted the trumpet. Later, Fancy Bulldozy caustically called those Republicans a cowardly group. So there was the feeling not that the trumpet had won, or that the dummy craps had failed again to pin his ass to the wall, but that the Republicans, who had voted not guilty, had failed.
to rise to the high mark of the occasion. It's also possible that a claim like that is sheer fluff and idiocy. As I see it, the dummy craps did not get the outcome they so deeply desired, but they sure did have a fun week of slamming the trumpet about from pillar to post. As for the trumpet, he immediately issued a statement dismissing the second impeachment trial as more of the witch hunt that had been going on since he was elected. He thanked his supporters and said he would continue the quest to restore America to true greatness. As for the seven, quote, defectors, unquote, I'm surprised there weren't more of them. The trumpet was not a politician or a party man. The Republicans had no great love for him. This was a wonderful opportunity to completely and finally defeat and destroy this enormous pain in the butt, and the dummy craps blew it again. It's a feeling they know all too well. They throw a party, have a hell of a lot of fun, but they do not get laid.